welcome again. And uh, I'm going to talk about Parkinson's disease and how to control tremors and improve movement with food choices. Food has a large effect on Parkinson's disease. I'm going to tell you about how food can interfere with the transport of tyrosine and levodopa, and this reduces dopamine production. When you quit interfering with these, dopamine production can increase, and the uh, amount of dopamine made in the brain can increase, thereby potentially cutting tremors and slow movements in half. This is exciting because you have direct control over how well the levodopa carbidopa is working and how well your body is making its own levodopa from tyrosine. Also, it's very important that we look at how Parkinson's disease started to develop in people and how we can stop it from progressing and developing further. And a large part of this is neurotoxins that are in food and we can avoid largely those neurotoxins. The idea with this is that you may not see an immediate change in symptoms, but we can slow the progression of the disease so that we don't get worse. When I keep the dopamine producing brain cells alive, that's a lot of the purpose of this talk today. I read a lot of studies and my favorite studies are ones that look at clinical trials where they have some people do this and some people do that and they see what works and doesn't work. Now, a lot of the studies look at risk for Parkinson's disease. In other words, if people eat a certain food and their risk goes up, what's happening? That food, say cheese, for example, may harbor contaminants such as the organochlorine pesticide lindane. And this pesticide can kill off the dopamine producing cells in the brain. This can happen before the disease is diagnosed and after the disease is diagnosed so that it can increase progression of the disease. As you lose more dopamine producing cells, your symptoms are likely to get worse and you'll need more of the drugs to help you along and that can lead to side effects. So my goal here is to let you know which pollutants can kill these dopamine producing cells and also we have defenses against our brain cells dying, mostly antioxidant defenses. And the two types of antioxidants are antioxidants that come from food, such as carotenoids, vitamin E and vitamin C, and polyphenols. And then there's the antioxidant enzymes that our bodies make, which are still dependent on food for the minerals that support these antioxidant enzymes. They just don't work without selenium, zinc, copper, and manganese. You'll see at the bottom of this screen and most of the screens that I have for you today, a reference uh, to a study. All of my information is based upon good scientific studies. And I want you to know that that is the case. And also you can look up these studies and read them yourself and verify what I'm telling you or go deeper into a certain area. Inside the brain, down near the bottom, it's something called the substantia nigra. It's shown in orange in this screen. The substantia nigra is where dopamine is made and then sent through axons into the striatum, which is just below that. There's a part of the substantia nigra called a, uh, that makes the dopamine and runs down into the striatum that controls movement. So this orange part is the substantia nigra, the pars compacta is in that, and that sends axons, which are the output of neurons, down into the striatum to control movement, to make your walking smoother, your tremors less, uh, if you have enough dopamine. And that's kind of the goal of what we're gonna do today. Uh, as I mentioned, this neurodegeneration, the loss of dopamine producing nerves can happen well, decades before Parkinson's disease is diagnosed. So we want to not only work with people with Parkinson's disease, but anyone listening today can reduce their risk of getting Parkinson's disease and quite dramatically, as you'll see as I go on. The drug used for Parkinson's disease is almost universally levodopa. 
often with carbidopa, and I'll show you why they add that. The levodopa is a precursor to dopamine. When it goes into the brain, our brains can make dopamine with levodopa. This is the standard therapy, but it does not slow neurodegeneration. It does not protect dopamine producing cells from dying. What I'm going to tell you is a lot about how to protect your dopamine producing cells from dying, from being lost. Any more of them. If you're diagnosed, it, chances are that you've already lost 50 to 60% or even more of those dopamine producing cells. So let's keep the rest of them because we need them. Dietary antioxidants are really helpful. And uh, I'll tell you more, I've got a whole section on that. So the first section of this talk today is how we can produce dopamine from tyrosine and levodopa. Now, many of you have heard of levodopa and uh, Cinemet is a common brand name for that. Tyrosine is an essential amino acid that's found in food, in protein foods. Uh, all foods have some protein and some more than others. But tyrosine is one of the essential amino acids. There are eight essential amino acids for adults. And we can make our own levodopa with tyrosine if conditions are right. Uh, on screen you, here, you'll see my Parkinson's disease dietary regulation of dopamine book. That's available on my website below, drsteepblake.com. Also, my wife, Catherine Blake, has written a book, Parkinson's disease cookbook. And these delicious recipes will help to implement the changes that I'm talking about, because many of them are with food. So how is dopamine made? Okay, here's a little diagram that I drew. Uh, we can start with levodopa as a drug, and that can then supply levodopa to the brain. But the transfer of levodopa as a drug into the brain is inhibited by excess protein. And I'm gonna show you how much excess protein most people eat coming soon. Also, tyrosine as an amino acid is eaten in the diet and tyrosine hydroxylase is an enzyme that creates levodopa in the brain. Now, you don't need to learn a lot of technical words for this talk, but try and remember tyrosine hydroxylase because that one's really important. There are certain things that interfere with it and destroy it and certain things that make it work better. But again, this tyrosine transfer into the brain to become levodopa is inhibited by excess protein. Once you've got levodopa in the brain, we have a enzyme that can convert levodopa into dopamine. And the carbidopa that is often taken with the levodopa prevents the step. It prevents levodopa from becoming dopamine, but the carbidopa doesn't enter the brain. It can't cross the blood brain barrier. So the carbidopa stops the levodopa from being used to make dopamine outside the brain, but does not interfere with it inside the brain. And then once you have dopamine made in your brain, it can be used and it can also be degraded. Uh, the monoamine oxidase degrades it. There are some drugs that inhibit monoamine oxidase, so you degrade less dopamine and there's more remaining. Higher levels of protein can block levodopa entry into the brain 50%. Even if your blood concentrations of levodopa are quite high and completely adequate, if it can't get into the brain, then it's not going to do you any good. All of the essential amino acids, except lysine, are large neutral amino acids, and they compete with levodopa for entry into the brain. They also compete with tyrosine for entry into the brain. So when you take the levodopa as a drug and you eat food as tyrosine, these need to be transferred from the intestine into the bloodstream. And this is done with the large uh, neutral amino acid transporter. This transporter gets busy, like a freeway gets busy at rush hour and not enough of the tyrosine and not enough of the levodopa can enter the bloodstream. The same roadblock happens when the blood comes near the blood brain barrier and you want to get this tyrosine and levodopa into the brain to control the tremors, to improve your movements, but it can't go in because you've eaten too much protein. Now, you need a neurologist, a movement specialist neurologist, if you have Parkinson's disease, to adjust your dosage and to 
diagnose and to con help you control the problems with Parkinson's disease. However, American neurologists do not generally study diet. They do not generally study amino acids and protein. They do not generally study medical plants or prescribe them. So what I'm gonna tell you today is in addition to what your neurologist may tell you, and feel free to discuss this with your neurologist, anything that I may say. One interesting thing is in, in the studies that I look at where they lower protein and people's movements become better, most of these studies, they have to actually reduce the levodopa dose because people don't need as much levodopa if they're not getting excessive protein. Isn't that interesting? Now, everyone talks about protein as if it's something we really need and we need more of. We need 46 grams a day. This is a standard established by the US, many other countries, the World Health Organization. It's, it's really quite common that we need about 10% of our calories as protein. And this works out to about 46 grams for adult humans, okay? So we need 46. The standard American diet is 149. The Atkins diet, 122. The zone diet and paleo diet are about 140. The bulletproof diet is 235. That's almost 200 grams of excess protein interfering with the absorption of tyrosine and levodopa into the brain, interfering with your ability to move. Well, haven't we heard that you can eat too little protein? What about on a vegan whole food diet? Is that under 46? No, 74. These analyses are done by myself with the software of the diet doctor that I developed based on the US Department of Agriculture data from the food composition database. So these are very accurate representations of how much protein real people get on these diets that are all fairly common. A vegetarian diet, 109. Mediterranean, 100. Uh, the raw vegan diet, which you would expect to be low, and there's actually variants of it that can be low, one variant ever I've tested, uh, but the generally 81. If they're eating a few nuts and seeds and sprouted beans, the protein is fine. So you can see from this that we're all getting too much protein, even vegans, unless you're careful and eat specially. My wife's health cookbook can really be helpful with that. Now, here's a, a series of four studies, and they reduce the protein per day to 56 grams. Okay, not quite down to 46. 35 grams, now that's not enough protein per day. I don't recommend going under the 46 grams per day, but it's very, very unusual for people to get less than that. Did you know that a, a serving, say two cups of spaghetti with nothing on it, has about 21 grams of protein out of the 46 that you need per day. So you can see how easy it is to exceed your protein. And oh, don't make the mistake of thinking protein's only in animal products. Beans and grains, for instance, and nuts have protein in them. And this needs to be considered when calculating your total protein intake. Another of these studies do 77 grams and another 63 grams. Okay, all of these are well below commonly eaten amounts of protein. The response rate, 100%, 100%, 100%, and 100%. All people on Parkinson's disease in these four studies responded very well, and they had to reduce the dose of levodopa because they're responding so well to the lowered protein. This is from a great study in Frontiers in Aging Neuroscience, 2017. Now there's a protein redistribution diet. A lot of people don't want to change their eating habits. And this is, this is very common. Uh, with Parkinson's disease, however, once people try changing their eating habits, they often will continue because the results are so good. So this variant of lowering protein is where you eat less protein for breakfast, less for lunch, and then at dinner time, eat the usual excess of protein. So after breakfast or before breakfast, you take your hopefully you should be taking your levodopa medication away from meals because of the protein. But the breakfast protein, because it's small, won't interfere with that levodopa and tyrosine from the food so that more of it enters your brain and you have less problems, less off time, less problems walking, less tremors. 
again, lunch, you're eating less protein. So you have less interference with your drug, less interference with your own making of levodopa from tyrosine. So you're feeling good in the afternoon. You can move around better. And then at dinner time, you eat lots of protein. It interferes with your medication. Typically, people are more sedentary in the evening and tremors are less problematic. And then you go to bed. So <laughs> this is a redistribution diet and it can be helpful. Response rates for this average about 80%. And uh, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? It, it is just amazing. What these people did on these studies was eat very little protein, just seven or 10 grams of protein all day until dinner time, and then they ate too much. And the response rates were excellent, 100% in one of them in the 80s, a couple of them in the 60%, so two thirds to three quarters of the people in these studies. What does that mean for you? It means that were you to try a protein redistribution diet, in other words, eating heavy protein only at dinner, but not the rest of the day, you have a good chance of reducing tremors and getting more on time until you eat your heavy protein and it interferes with your ability to create dopamine and have that help you. This is a fascinating study done by Luciana Baroni in Italy. She had already worked with these patients and gotten their protein down to 67 grams per day, which as you can remember from my graph, that's below any of the diets that I showed you. 67 is, is uh, already lower than most people are going to eat on almost any diet. And then during the study, she reduced the protein down to 49 grams per day. Remember that's more than the 46 grams needed. So it's adequate, it's not a low protein diet, it's an adequate protein diet, but not excessive. What happened? Amazing the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale doubled. It went from 25 to 47. So it virtually doubled. So that means half the tremors, twice the walking speed. In other words, all of their symptoms got better. And uh, how long did this take? One month. And I've seen results even quicker.